स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया session uh, what we'll do is we'll first uh, uh, sort of graphically look at the dominant firm competitive fringe model we have already uh, looked at the algebra we have seen that the presence of the uh, that presence of the competitive fringe uh, reduces the ability of the dominant firm uh, by preventing it from doing whatever a standard monopolist would do uh, graphically we'll see uh, how how uh, the pricing decision of a dominant firm uh, looks like and we will then uh, close the model by introducing the effect of entry okay so if i look at the uh, so so let's let's draw two pictures so in the first graph we'll have uh, so so we'll have the market demand curve right so we'll have the market demand which we said was qm in both cases okay uh, let's suppose that p lower bar so so for simplicity let's suppose that all the n fringe firms are identical so let's uh, let's let's say that p lower bar is the minimum average variable cost of Uh, each fringe firm so the shutdown price is p lower bar so for any price that the dominant firm sets which is below p lower bar the fringe firms will not be producing any quantity so suppose the supply of the fringe firms the supply curve of each fringe firm is given by mc sub f so this is the supply curve of each fringe firm so with the n fringe firms combined if we aggregate this we would get the fringe supply we would get the fringe supply which our notation says is qf p this is the fringe supply so the dominant firms the dominant firms residual demand we said is the market demand minus the supply of the fringe firms this is the dominant firms uh, demand curve so for any price below p lower bar below p lower bar the the fringe firms would not supply so the market so the the residual demand for the dominant firm will follow the old demand curve so this is qm right so if i wanted to draw the uh, demand curve for the dominant firm for any price less than less than p lower bar the demand there is the residual demand curve would follow this shape because the fringe firms are not supplying any quantity now for a price which is say let's say some some price here uh, call it p1 or p cap the fringe is able to meet the entire supply right so the residual demand for the dominant firm essentially is going to be zero so for all prices between this particular price and p lower bar the residual demand for the dominant firm would look somewhat like this so the residual demand of the dominant firm is drawn in uh, in, in 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 the red color so that's the residual demand curve if that's the residual demand curve well what would be the pricing decision of this dominant firm so recall we said that the do dominant firm the dominant firm acts as a monopolist the dominant firm acts as a monopolist with respect to the residual demand curve in other words the dominant firm would ask what is its residual marginal revenue curve and then choose and, and then choose a price accordingly right For, figure out what the optimal quantity is and thereby figure out what the price is so what does the marginal revenue curve of the dominant firm look like so in the if if the entire demand curve was available to the dominant firm the marginal revenue curve would have taken this particular shape but notice that the only portion of the 
demand curve which is overlapping with the old demand curve is the one in red font right. So, so for the first portion of the residual demand curve, so for the first portion of the residual demand curve, the, the marginal revenue curve of the dominant firm will be twice as steep as this portion of the red demand curve. Thereafter, thereafter the residual demand curve will follow the old demand curve. So, this would be the marginal revenue curve of the dominant firm based on the residual demand right. So, I will put it as a residual demand just to highlight the difference between the regular marginal revenue curve and the residual marginal revenue curve. Now, once the residual marginal revenue curve is obtained, what the dominant firm is going to do is the, mono, the dominant firm is going to choose the optimal quantity and therefore, the price is going to get determined. So, suppose the marginal cost of the dominant firm is somewhere here. So, let us say this is the marginal cost, let us call it M C 0 of the dominant firm. So, if the dominant firm's marginal cost is there, the dominant firm will set the marginal revenue to equal the marginal cost and will choose the optimal quantity Q star D and the price will be let us say P D. This price we can trace it out to this graph, this would be the dominant firm's price P C a uh, P D and at this price each of the fringe firms would supply some quantity. So, the n fringe firms combined would supply let us say a quantity which is equal to Q f P d. This is the total quantity which is supplied by the fringe firms. The dominant firms quantity is Q d star. So, the total quantity demanded is this is Q m P d. So, essentially this gap here, this gap here is what is supplied is, is the quantity that is produced by the dominant firm which is Q star D. So, essentially this and this portion are actually equal. So, the, 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 the choice of the optimal quantity remains the same by setting the marginal revenue to equal the marginal cost. What, what is different now is that the dominant firm unlike a monopolist has to first figure out what the residual demand curve is. Based on the residual demand it figures out what the marginal revenue curve is and thereafter chooses the optimal quantity and the price gets determined. Okay. Now, so this was the case where the uh, marginal cost curve was at M C 0. If the marginal cost curve of the of the uh, dominant firm, if the marginal if the, if the dominant firm is extremely efficient let us say wherein the marginal cost curve let us say somewhere here. So, let us say this is M C D 1 right. So, the marginal cost curve of the dominant firm is at a, a very low level, well the dominant firm will set its marginal revenue to equal the marginal cost and will then choose to produce some quantity let us say Q hat D and at this price and at this price let us say the price is P hat D. If P hat D is lower than P lower bar, the dominant firm, the dominant firm may shut out the fringe. So, whether the fringe firms will be there or not depends on what the marginal cost of the dominant firm is. If the marginal cost of the dominant firm is somewhere around M C 0, then the optimal price is P D, optimal price is P D and at this price both the fringe firms and the dominant firm exist. Whereas, if the dominant firm is extremely efficient and its marginal cost is let us say M C 1 D, then the optimal quantity that it produces is Q hat D which leads to a price which is P hat D which is less than P lower bar and the fringe firm is driven out of the market right. So, whether the fringe will be there or not depends on what the marginal cost or what, what the price is essentially is chosen by the dominant firm which in turn depends on what the marginal cost of the dominant firm is. Now, this was a model where we had the number of firms being fixed. What if we had 
free entry n is not fixed. So, how would the model change if fringe firms could enter the industry? Now, why would a fringe firm enter? Well, if the existing fringe firms are making positive economic profit, that attracts other fringe firms to enter this industry. Now, when n is not fixed, when there is free entry, essentially the dominant firm, the dominant firm faces a trade off. On the one hand, it could, it could set a very high price and earn a very large profit, but it runs the risk of attracting more number of fringe firms from the next period onwards. So, extract as much profit now extract as much profit now and essentially make hay while the sun shines. Which is to say that a particular the dominant firm wants to do as much as it can in the first period itself. It realizes that from the next period onwards there is going to be entry, so be it. So, I will extract as much profit now as possible or be a bit more conservative. So, choose a price so as to restrict entry in each period. Right? On, on one hand, I could simply set a very high price, extract as much profit now as possible and realize that eventually there is going to be entry from next period onwards and my prof profit margin will be reducing. Or choose a more conservative approach and thereby regulate or moderate entry in each period. So, so essentially when I say restrict entry, essentially charging a lower price, charging a lower price would, would have a slower rate of entry. Which one of these two uh, strategies the dominant firm will adopt will eventually depend on the present discounted value of profits that the monopolist uh, that the dominant firm is going to earn between the two between the two strategies right but eventually eventually the dominant firm will be forced to concede the entire market that is the market becomes competitive. Okay. So, what we have looked here is uh, a graphical depiction of how the dominant firm chooses its uh, pricing decision, which is similar to how a mono monopolist would behave. The only difference is that unlike the case of a monopolist which just looks at its marginal revenue curve and equates the marginal revenue to with the marginal cost, a dominant firm looks at the residual demand curve and then sets the residual demand to equal the marginal cost. Okay. And when you have entry which is free, well there is essentially a trade off that the dominant firm faces. Okay. So, let us move on to uh, a slightly newer topic which is we will which is price discrimination. In the discussion until now, we had the monopolist who was maximizing profit by charging a uniform price. Right? So, until now we have had the monopolist, until now the monopolist was charging the same price to all consumers, monopolist was setting a uniform price. But very often a monopolist or any firm with market power can earn a higher profit by charging different price to different consumers. A monopolist or a firm with market power or a firm with market power can earn a higher profit by charging 
different price to different consumers by charging a different price to different consumers. This practice is called price discrimination. And we will use the notation P D to, to um, say save space. Okay. Now, some examples of price discrimination that uh, you would have encountered in your day to day lives. One is um, airline pricing. The price of the same airline ticket varies uh, along the day, across the day, right. So, price of the price of the same ticket can vary from day to day. There are senior citizen discounts right. So, for example, if you book a ticket on the railways and if the person is a senior citizen, the, the price paid for the ticket by that senior citizen is different than what a non-senior citizen would pay, okay. Then uh, textbook pricing, right. So, hardcover versus soft cover books. The content inside both the hardcover and the softcover version are identical. They have the same number of pages, the, the, the everything is exactly identical in the way it is written in both the books. It is just that it is a different uh, sort of the, the, the binding is different and uh, that also uh, leads to uh, prices being different for the two textbooks. And um, if you have uh, if you have looked at mobile pricing plans, right, so different mobile pricing plans. So, these are some examples of price discrimination that we encounter, okay. There are three types of price discrimination techniques that we are going to focus on. Okay. So, the three types of price discrimination that we will focus on are the following. So, we will start with something called perfect price discrimination. This is also called first degree price discrimination. Okay. Then we have price discrimination based on observable characteristics. Right. This is called third degree PD. Right. So, this is called third degree price discrimination. And finally, we have price discrimination based on unobservable characteristics. This is called second degree price discrimination. Okay. And we will look at certain examples in uh, 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 we will we'll sort of illustrate all of these with a particular numerical example. So, as to uh, get a sense of uh, in which case is the profit the highest um, compared to the other techniques. Now, uh, before we uh, uh, analyze these in details, there are two important points to note about uh, price discrimination. So, uh, to implement price discrimination, so, to implement price discrimination, the monopolist, the monopolist must know who is who on the demand curve. This is not a very easy task, right. So, for some goods which are purchased in typically single units, say for example, if I am uh, buying a refrigerator or a television or a washing machine, typically we buy a single unit of these. So, a demand curve will capture, so, so if when, I, when I look at the demand curve, uh, consumers who have a higher willingness to pay are basically on the top of the demand curve, whereas consumers who have a lower willingness to pay are on the uh, lower portion of the demand curve, right. But for uh, for for goods which are purchased in multiple amounts, say for example, uh, watching a movie, buying books, right? Uh, then uh, the willingness to pay for consumers differ as we buy different quantities of the good. So the demand curve includes information not just about the willingness to pay of different consumers, but also about how the willingness to pay of a single consumer changes as he or she buys more of it. 
So, even though uh, we are saying that for uh, monopolist to implement PD, the monopolist must know who is who on the demand curve. Let us keep in mind that this is, uh, this is uh, not, not a very simple task for a firm to do. And the second uh, very important thing for a firm to do is that the monopolist must be able to prevent people who buy the product at a lower price from reselling it to consumers at a much higher price. So, in other words, a monopolist must be able to must be able to prevent must be able to prevent uh, those who are offered the product those who are offered the product at lower price at a lower price from reselling it to other consumers at a higher price. Okay. So, with these two points in mind, let us first start with perfect price discrimination. Okay. So, suppose we have a demand curve as follows. And let us say this is the marginal cost curve for the firm. Okay. While the analysis is true for any firm with market power, we will simply focus on the uh, price discrimination techniques adopted by a monopolist firm. So, th though the idea would be similar for any firm with market power. Right. So, perfect price discrimination exists when the monopolist is able to is able to charge the maximum price each consumer is willing to pay is willing to pay for each unit of the product sold right so let's think about this so for for a firm to be able to implement perfect price discrimination the firm is able to charge the maximum price each consumer is willing to pay for which i need to know the entire demand curve so I know for this unit the price that I would set is going to be equal to this amount. So, essentially this is the willingness to pay of the consumer, I extract that entire amount. For the second unit the willingness to pay is some quantity here, for the third unit the willingness to pay is some quantity here. So, for the first unit I charge a price which is here, for the second unit I charge a price which is somewhere here, for the third unit I charge a price which is here all the way uh, until I move on to the fourth unit and so on. So, what do I do? So, I set a price which is equal to, so set a price which is equal to the maximum willingness to pay of the consumer and two, and two sell up to the point, sell up to the point where the price is equal to marginal cost. Notice the moment this condition is satisfied we are going to have exactly an outcome which is which which is what we would get if the market was perfectly competitive so i would keep on selling till the price is exactly equal to the marginal cost so let's call this to be the q star f unit right so at the q star f unit the price is exactly equal to the marginal cost so for all these units the price that i charge is greater than the marginal cost of that particular unit right so the key difference the, the 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 key difference then with perfect competition is the following so I am able to sell Q star units, right. If I am able to sell Q star units and Q star units is what I would have sold if the market was perfectly competitive, we are essentially getting the total surplus that is possibly uh, that could possibly be generated even under this setting. The key difference is that the entire entire surplus entire surplus is captured by the firm by the monopolist the entire surplus is captured by the monopolist right so there is nothing which remains with the consumers because for the first unit the maximum willingness to pay of the consumer was this price i set a price p1 which is exactly equal to this amount i set a price p2 for the second unit which is exactly equal to this amount so the entire willingness to pay is captured so the consumer surplus is essentially equal to zero the producer surplus or the monopolist surplus is equal to the total surplus that is generated which if quantity was a continuous uh, variable then 
I would get the total surplus which is equal to the area ABC which is also the total surplus that would be generated under a perfectly competitive market. So, there is no dead weight loss which arises when a firm practices perfect price discrimination, but the distribution of the total surplus is, is skewed it the entire surplus goes to the goes to the uh, uh, goes to the firm. Now, the uh, the way in which perfect price discrimination can be implemented is by using two techniques. So, perfect price discrimination can be implemented using a two part tariff rule using a two part tariff right. So, what the two part tariff does is the two part tariff will have as the name suggests uh, a fixed fee a fixed fee which gives the right to the consumer which gives the consumer uh, the right to purchase the good and then you have a usage fee or a per unit fee that the consumer has to pay for each unit of the good that he buys. Theme parks practice two part tariff uh, use two part tariffs a lot right. So, when you when you enter a theme park typically you pay you you pay a fixed fee which is the price of the ticket that gives you the right to enter the park and then depending on the rights that you want to take you pay a usage fee or a per unit fee. The other technique that is used to implement perfect price discrimination is what is called block pricing. So, under block pricing, so this is another example of a nonlinear pricing scheme by which the firm can achieve the same outcome as what a two part tariff generates. So, the seller bundles, so in this case, the seller bundles the total quantity. the seller bundles the total quantity that he is willing to sell that he is willing to sell with the total charge with the total charge that he wishes to set for the quantity. So, in a two part tariff there is the fixed fee and the usage fee, but in the block pricing scheme the seller bundles the total quantity that he is willing to sell with the total charge that he wishes to set for the quantity. Let us take an example to see how these uh, the, the two uh, techniques for implementing first for perfect price discrimination works. So, let us say that there is a uh, there are two groups of consumers. So, let us take an example which we will use all through for other uh, price discrimination techniques also. So, there are two groups of consumers, one is a high income consumer wherein the group is P H equal to 16 minus Q H and a low income group consumer is P L equals 12 minus Q L. Let us say that the marginal cost, so this is the high income group, this is the low income group and let us say the marginal cost is equal to 4. For, uh, for each of those two markets right. So, the marginal cost of production in each of these markets is 4. Now, as a baseline case, as a baseline case, let us look at uniform pricing and then we will get to first degree price discrimination in, in a moment. So, in uniform pricing what we would do is we would first ask well this is the high income group demand curve. So, this is 16 and 16, then we have the low income group demand curve which is 12 and 12 and then we aggregate and get the total demand curve. Right. So, how would we aggregate it? So, notice that for the high income group Q H is 16 minus p q l essentially is 12 minus p. So, if we wanted to aggregate, so for any price for any price between 12 and 16 only the high income group market would be present. So, essentially 
the high income group market would be present ok. So, this is 12, this is 16 and essentially this coordinate is 4 right. So, so, so we would have the demand curve being q equals 16 minus p as long as the price is between 12 and 16 right. And for prices less than uh, 12 both the groups are active, both the groups are active. So, the total market demand is 28 minus 2 p for a price which is greater than 12. So, if I have a demand curve which looks like this right. So, there is a top portion which is only existing for the high income group and the uh, both the demand curves are active for the remaining group. Now, so, so if we rewrite this, so if I rewrite this, okay, so I will use uh, the space on the top. So, I can rewrite this as in inverse demand curve as p equals 16 minus q, p equals 16 minus q for p equals 16 minus q for q less than equal to 4, for q less than equal to 4 and I can rewrite this portion as 14 minus 1 half of q for q greater than 4. For this portion the inverse demand curve is what it is, is what this looks like ok. So, uh, what is the uh, optimal pricing uh, rule then? So, I would need to find out what the marginal revenue curve is the marginal revenue would be set equal to the marginal cost and thereby we would figure out what the optimal quantity and prices are. So, for the top portion of the demand curve the marginal revenue curve based on p equal to 16 minus q would be the it would be 16 minus 2 q it would be 16 minus 2 q. So, if I were to draw it so at q equal to 4 it takes a value which is equal to 8. So, if I were to draw so this is 8. So, this is this portion and the marginal revenue curve based on the second portion of the inverse demand curve would be 14 minus q would be 14 minus q. So, at q equal to 4 it takes a value which is equal to 10 and this marginal revenue curve would be something like this. So, this is the marginal revenue curve of the firm. So, the firm is so this would be 10 the marginal cost the marginal cost is is 4. So, the marginal cost is 4 here the marginal cost is 4. So, when I set the marginal revenue to equal the marginal cost essentially the firm is identifying the quantity here. So, essentially it is this portion of the marginal revenue curve which is intersecting with the marginal cost curve. So, marginal revenue equals marginal cost gives q u as 10 units. So, the monopolist is selling 10 units and the uniform price that the monopolist is going to charge the price that the monopolist is going to charge p u is essentially going to be 14 minus 5 which is equal to 9. So, the monopolist is going to charge a price which is equal to 9. So, that price is somewhere here. and which essentially says that when I charge a price of 9 rupees per unit the quantity that the monopolist is selling is 7 in this market and 3 in this market which adds up to. So, I will sell 7 in the H type market I will sell 3 in the L type market. So, what is the total profit of the monopolist? So, the the uniform price is 9 rupees per unit the quantity that I sell is 10 is 10 units. So, the unif under uniform pricing the profit of the monopolist is essentially 9 minus the marginal cost which is 4 times the quantity sold. So, that is rupees 50 right. So, let us keep that in mind. Now, suppose the monopolist were to practice perfect price discrimination or first degree price discrimination. What would the monopolist do? So, the monopolist would essentially charge a fixed fee. So, if I look at the market for H type. And this is my marginal cost right. So, what the firm would do is the firm would essentially set a price I would set a price which is equal to the marginal cost 
of 4 thereby figure, figuring out that the total quantity that would be sold is going to be 12 units right. So, so recall q h is 16 minus p. So, if the price was 4 the quantity that I would sell is equal to 12. Then I would set a fixed fee which is f h which would be equal to the entire consumer surplus. So, under first degree price discrimination the consumers do not get any surplus. So, the fixed fee would exactly be equal to the consumer surplus that is going to be equal to 1 half times 12 times 12 which is rupees 72. For the low type market for the L type market this is 12 and 12 again I would set a price which is equal to marginal cost thereby selling 8 units. So, set a price which is equal to marginal cost which is 4 which will give me q l equal to. So, recall q l is 12 minus p. So, the number of units that they would buy is 8 units and f l would be equal to the consumer surplus in this market it will be 1 half of 8 times 8 which is equal to 32. So, the total profit under first degree price with perfect price discrimination for the monopolist is I get a fixed fee. So, the so the revenue that I get with the fixed fee for the high type is 72, but then I charge a price which is equal to 4. So, the usage fee is 4 rupees per unit. So, I do not make money on that component. Uh, so, I extract the entire consumer surplus. Similarly, for the L type the uh, fee that I charge is 32. So, the which is equal to the consumer surplus I put a usage fee of 4 rupees per unit. So, again I do not get uh, any any uh, earnings there. So, the total profit is 104 which is greater than the 50 that I earned under uniform pricing right. So, clearly first degree price discrimination is allowing me to charge uh, to to get to earn a much larger profit. Now, how would this work under block pricing scheme? So, if this was a block pricing scheme what the firm would do is the firm and recall what the block pricing scheme was. The block pricing scheme said the sender seller bundles the total quantity that he is willing to sell with the total charge that he wishes to set for the quantity right with the total charge that he wishes to set for the quantity. Now, what uh, quantity do I want to sell? I want to sell 12 units to the high type, I want to sell 8 units to the low type. So, essentially the monopolist needs to figure out what is the block fee or the what is the price that he is going to charge. So, he think of he, uh, here price as the total amount that the consumers are going to pay for all those 12 units. So, for those 12 units for those 12 units essentially so this is 16 and 16 and the marginal cost is 4. So, to sell 12 units where did we get the 12? So, based on price equals marginal cost I want to sell 12 units the fee that I set is equal to the total willingness to pay for the consumer for all those 12 units right. So, set the fee or rather let us make it b h the block fee will be equal to the entire area of this trapezoidal uh, this trapezoidal area which is 1 half times 1 half times 16 plus 4 times 12. So, this is going to be 120 and similarly for the L type for the for the market which is uh, the low income group uh, let me draw it here. This is 12, this is 12. So, I sell 8 units, but then I put the block fee equal to the total willingness to pay. So, the L now is essentially going to be 1 half of 12 plus 4 times 8 which is 64. So, essentially the block fee is I sell 12 units and charge 120 rupees where is that 120 that is the block fee that that is the block price that I charge for these 12 units and for the low income group I offer 8 units and I charge 64 right. And, and notice for the moment that here I can see who is of which type right. So, there is never a worry about whether one particular group is going to buy what is designed for the other group we will worry we will we'll get to that a little bit later. Right? So, the profit using block pricing scheme is basically 120 plus 64 minus well I am selling uh, uh, so, so I need to pay uh, the marginal cost of 4, 4 rupees for each one of those units. So, that is totally 20 units times 4. 
So, that is 184 minus 80 which is equal to rupees 104 and notice this is exactly identical to what we had under a two part tariff scheme right. So, whatever we can do using a two part tariff can also be done using a block pricing scheme. But essentially the main takeaway here is that uh, perfect price discrimination can be implemented using either of these two methods and they clearly give me a much larger profit than what I would have gotten had I practiced uniform pricing. Let us move on and look at price discrimination based on observable characteristics. Price discrimination based on observable characteristics. So, if I look at price discrimination based on observable characteristics, what do we get? So, this is defined by certain key three key ingredients. So, the, the fact that there are some observable characteristics tells us that the that there is some observable characteristic say say income or age or let us say education right. So, these are observable which allows the firm to basically segregate the entire group of consumers into different segments right. Income age used to segregate consumers into different groups. So, this is this is important right. So, there is some observable characteristic and I am able to uh, segregate them into different groups in terms of their willingness to pay. Thereafter, I need to ensure that people in one group do not buy and sell the product in the other group which is the monopolist needs to prevent arbitrage. across groups and finally, the way, the way I would price is. So, the monopolist would quote the same price to same price per unit to all consumers within a group. So, I would quote the same price to all consumers within a group and then the consumers decide to purchase at the quoted price. So, there are three key ingredients that we need to keep in mind when we think of price discrimination based on observable characteristics which is third degree price discrimination. One is that I should be able to segregate people into, uh, in, into two different groups, I should be able to prevent arbitrage across groups and people within the group pay the same price right. Now, let us let us step back and look at our uh, let us look at the uh, let us look at this uh, example that we talked about a little while earlier and see why uniform pricing is not optimal. Well, if you look at uniform pricing here, you will notice. So, if I were to draw, if I were to draw the marginal revenue curve for this group, if I were to draw the marginal revenue curve, so let us say let us use a different color. So, this would be the marginal revenue curve for the age type. So, this would be 8 and the marginal revenue curve here would be for the low term. Notice that for the for the seventh unit right. So, so let us actually draw it a little bit better. Okay, so, this is the marginal revenue curve. Now, we figured out that the total quantity that the monopolist was selling under uniform pricing was 10 to uh, was 10 of which 7 were told were, were, were sold in the high income group and 3 in the low income group right. Now, notice that the marginal revenue for the 7th unit the marginal revenue for the 7th unit is lower than the marginal cost. Well, what is the marginal revenue for the 7th unit? Well, the marginal revenue for the 7th unit in this market is uh, rupees uh, 16 minus 14. So, that is 2 rupees per unit which is less than the marginal cost ok. So, let us make a note of that. 
So, the marginal revenue for the seventh unit in the high tech market which is 16 minus 2 times 7 is rupees 2 per unit is less than the marginal cost. Whereas, if I look at the low income group, uh, I was selling 3 units, the marginal revenue on the third unit, the marginal revenue on the third unit is actually greater than the marginal cost, right. So, the marginal revenue on the third unit which is 12 minus 2 times 3 which is uh, 6 is greater than the marginal cost of 4, right. So, that tells us that the monopolist could do better by actually shifting output from the age group to the L group, right. So, so trans so this essentially implies implies that the monopolist can increase profit can increase profit by shifting output or reallocating output from H to L. More formally a necessary condition for profit maximization is that marginal revenue be equal to marginal cost in each market. The marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost in each market that the monopolist serves. If that is not the case, then the last unit, the last unit in a particular market is earning less or more compared to the last unit is earning less or more let us be more let us be more precise in terms of cost right is earning less or more in terms of cost uh, compared to the revenue and there is always a scope for reallocation just as we had here right. So, in, the, in, a, in other words the third unit was was earning less in cost compared to the revenue. So, so, it made sense for us to shift output from the H type to the L type market. Right? What does this mean formally? So, essentially this means that the monopolist needs to set the marginal revenue in the H type market to equal the marginal cost and the monopolist also needs to set the marginal revenue in the N type market which to equal the marginal cost which essentially means that I want a condition which is MRH which is equal to MRL. Right? Before we do the uh, numerical part of it, let us let us sort of formalize this a bit more, right. We know that the marginal revenue, so, uh, so we know that the total revenue that a firm earns is essentially the price times the quantity, right. So, the monopolist earns a total revenue which is price times the quantity. So, the marginal revenue that the firm earns is the change in total revenue with respect to output. So, this is essentially the dq of p times q. So, this can be rewritten as p, I will drop the, uh, uh, the stuff in the bracket plus q times dp dq and this can be simplified as p times 1 plus q divided by p dp dq. Recall that price elasticity of demand essentially is the percentage change in quantity resulting from a percentage change in price which is dq dp times p by q. So, this is essentially the term here is essentially the inverse of the price elasticity of demand. So, this essentially means that the marginal revenue is basically p times 1 and I know this is a negative number. So, I can rewrite this as 1 upon the absolute value of elasticity, right. So, translated to our setting what we want is we want the marginal revenue in the H type market to be exactly equal to the marginal revenue in the L type market. So, essentially we have MRH which is so, M R H which is equal to P H times 1 minus 1 over the absolute value of elasticity, M R L is equal to P L times 1 minus 1 over the absolute value of elasticity. So, this essentially means that I have P H times 1 minus 1 upon E H 
which is equal to P L times 1 minus 1 upon E L or P H upon P L is equal to 1 minus 1 upon E L divided by 1 minus 1 upon E H. This is what it means, right. So, this, this implies, this implies that if the price elasticity of demand is very high in one market, which means that consumers are very sensitive to the price in one, in, in that particular market, the firm actually should not charge a very high price there. So, the, so the rule is, so the, so the rule is that, that I charge a price, so consumers who have a, who have a low price elasticity of demand, consumers who have a low price elasticity of demand should be charged, should be charged a higher price compared to consumers for whom the price elasticity of demand is high. In other words, if, if E H is greater than E L, right, if E H is greater than E L, it essentially means 1 upon E H, if E H is greater than E L, okay, so it essentially means that 1 upon E H will be less than 1 upon E L, which means minus of 1 upon E H would be greater than minus of 1 upon E L. So, 1 minus 1 upon E H would be greater than 1 minus 1 upon E L, which is to say that 1 minus 1 upon E H by 1 minus 1 upon E L is a number greater than 1, is a number greater than 1, which essentially means that 1 minus 1 upon E L divided by 1 minus 1 upon E H is a number which is less than 1, right. So, if E H is greater than E L, right, so where, where consumers are extremely sensitive to a change in price in the H market, then I would actually want to charge a lower price. So, this essentially means, this essentially means P H by P L, which is equal to 1 minus 1 upon 1 upon E L divided by 1 minus 1 upon E H, right. And if this condition is true, we essentially have P H is less than P L. So, I would charge a lower price to the to, to the market where consumers are extremely sensitive to a change in price. So, this is the general rule for a firm which is practicing uh, price discrimination based on observable characteristic. Now, if we go back to our example, right. So, we have a firm which is, so essentially I set the marginal revenue, I set the marginal revenue to equal the marginal cost in each market. So, this is my MRH, this is the marginal cost. So, I set 16 minus 2 Q to equal the marginal cost which is 4 and I sell a quantity Q H which is equal to 6 units and I charge a price which is equal to 10. So, the price charged is equal to 10 which essentially means that the profit that I get from this group of customers is 10 minus 4 times 6, which is equal to 36 rupees. On the other hand, for the low type group of customers, low type group of customers, we again set the marginal revenue to equal the marginal cost. So, I have 12 minus 2 Q equals 4. So, Q L is equal to 4. So, pi L and, and the price that I charge is then 8. Right? So, the price here is inverse demand curve is 16 minus Q, inverse demand curve is 12 minus Q. So, the price that I charge is 8. So, the profit is 8 minus 4 times 4 which is equal to 16. So, the total profit that 
the firm earns is 36 plus 16 which is rupees 52 which is still greater than the 50 that I earn when I am doing uniform pricing. It is much lower than the profit that I get when the firm is practicing perfect price discrimination, but it is larger than the profit that the firm earns when it is doing uniform pricing. Okay. So, so we looked at uh, we looked at perfect price discrimination, we looked at price discrimination based on observable characteristics. Now, let us look at price discrimination which is based on unobservable characteristics. So, so price discrimination based on unobservable characteristics. So, here unlike the previous case, I am not able, so, so here the firm knows that there are these two groups of customers, but is not able to divide the customers into these two groups. Right? If, I, if, if I knew exactly who was of which type, I would have practiced perfect price discrimination. Now, if I am not able to do that, but I know somebody is a senior citizen or not, I may, I am able to divide them into these two groups and I am charging them a different price uh, and I am charging a different price to consumers within the two groups. Um, or, or rather across the two groups uh, and in the in the case where I am not able to uh, to to figure out some observe some uh, characteristic uh, where I am able to divide them into groups what should the firm do. So, let us see whether the block pricing scheme will work or not. So, will the block pricing scheme will the block pricing scheme of let us say 12 units and rupees 120 and 8 units and rupees 64 work. Let us think about this. So, this is the low H type, let us say this is the H type. So, I have 16, 24 and I have the L type which is 12 and 12 this is the marginal cost. Now, how much would the, so, so if the, if the firm were to offer these two sort of schemes, right. So, you buy 12 units, you pay 120 or you buy 8 units and you pay 64 rupees, right. Let us look at what the H type is going to do. So, let us ask, so for 8 units, so 8 is somewhere here what would be the total willingness to pay for the high type group. So, the total willingness to pay, total willingness to pay for 8 units, for 8 units is going to be essentially this entire area, right. So, this is the total willingness to pay which is 1 half of 16 plus 4 times 8. So, that is rupees rupees 80, right. Whereas, the block pricing scheme only asks for 64 rupees to be paid, right. So, uh, beg your pardon. So, this is 16 plus 8 times 8. So, that is 96. So, let us rewrite this properly. So, 1 half of 16 plus 8 times 8. So, that is rupees 96, right which is greater than which is greater than the rupees 64 that the firm asks. So, essentially the high type gets a surplus of rupees 32. So, the high type will want will also want to buy the 8 units at rupees 64 because compared to 12 units at rupees 120, he gets a surplus by buying the 8 units at rupees 64. So, clearly this block pricing scheme does not work. So, how should the firm then price these 2 units differently across the 2 groups and implement second degree price discrimination? We will discuss this in the next module. Thank you.